expectations. What kind of upside potential would it open for the markets from here? See, Tanvir, in my career, I have, you know, tried to predict the direction, not the depth. <laughs> so the question is, I can predict a trend where it will stop, how far it will go. I have no targets. I'm not a chartist. I know, absolutely. So therefore, there is upside. See, the, as things stand today, there has been some slowing of the economy from January onwards. There is some kind of apprehensions in the debt market. Right? So see, it will, it will depend upon how things play out. I don't think there can be a slowdown in India for long. Sure. So, second thing I feel is that a decisive, you know, governments by itself are not so important, but decisive governments are important. And I'm particularly a supporter of the Modi government. And I think that their coming back is significant and could play an important role in India's economic evolution over the next four or five years. Fair enough. But in 2014, in the calendar itself, and I'm not trying to push you to give me uh, a number here, but, you know, just give us the kind of, uh, uh, you know, direction that the markets can take forward in reaction to uh, uh, the news that will play out in favor of the market. I would say one thing that, you know, after this election result and after the uncertainty or the, you know, the market's already priced in some kind of a dispute between America and China. Another uncertainty, of course, is this Iran and American friction, which I think ultimately is going to go nowhere, right? It's just uh, Trump making a lot of noise. But Iran is being pushed into a corner, so I'm not sure that they won't, you know, they won't do anything which is funny. Yeah. I think markets made a bottom around 11,000. Now, how long will it go? go? How high will it go? How long it will take? That we can only know in posterity. We can know the, you know, we can know the direction. We can know an approximate high or bottom. You know, we can't predict the, how much it will go when it will go. In 2014, the markets returned 31%, which is when the Modi government came in for the first term. But then they didn't return anything for two years, no? Fair enough. So I don't think you're going to return 30% this year. But I think markets are going to be good. Okay. Uh, that's as if the results come as per expectations. Now, the tricky part with the polls is what we've seen uh, as how it's played out in Australia with Scott Morrison coming back for a second term. And uh, the exit polls getting it completely wrong. What so is the like risk this, of that? Too. It's like this, that you, are, you met a girl, you got engaged to her. Times are good. You hope the wedding will also be good. And nothing untoward will happen. Yeah. Well, but having said that, I think if the, if the NDA is not to get a majority, and a situation that also may not upset the market so much, but if a situation arises where the BJP and its allies are not able to form the government, I think that may be very troublesome for the market. But I don't think that's likely. Okay. So just for our international audience, I want to establish that, uh, you know, 543 seats in the lower house of parliament are up for grabs. Uh, 272 is the midpoint, and whoever crosses that mark forms the government next. If the NDA with BJP comes in with, between 220 to 240 mm. uh, and needs some external support, you think that also will be in, uh, in the realms of expectations? See, 220 and 240 is a big figure. But I think the NDA, if it gets anything up to 240, I think even the present NDA gets 240 seats, which I think is unlikely, they'll get 300. If they get 240, also they will only form the government. Okay, and Without that will also be okay for the markets. 220, 215, then question marks will arise. And that'll be okay for the markets? That won't be okay. The best scenario is a 300 seats prediction or the NDA in a majority by itself. Second is an NDA in, in short by 20 seats, 20, 25 seats, not BJP NDA. Yes. And then if the NDA is short, 50, 60 seats for a majority, then things will be dicey. How dicey? Again, I told you, we can predict the dicey. <laughs> so, okay. so we need, them. you know, How can uh, three market? months that I'm... A, mm -hmm. a woman, I know, I'm going home late, my wife's going to be angry. How angry can I predict? <laughs> So I can predict the direction, you know, but I can't predict the depth. I'll tell you why I'm asking you this, sir, because over the last six months and three months of that I've been overseas, people have been asking me about the impact range. So, yes, if things work out, there's the potential upside. If things don't work out, what is the potential downside? And then do quant analysis, man. That's the only way. <laughs> you know, I don't, people may predict, but what does it mean? You can predict a direction. The depth is you discover it every day. I mean, I feel the markets up, but I watch its movement. 
right? That movement tells me whether it's going to go up further or not. Today, by seeing in the, see the index at 11,500, I can't say 12,500 is the top, right? And I think those who try to ultimately lose. Right. But is there a support level in your mind where I think the if India gets a clear majority, I think 10,750, 11,000 is on the bottom. So that's the headline coming in from Rakesh Nimala. And the upside, you think? Who knows? Okay. Market Can't may consolidate. Clear. It may not gain much. It may take time. It may play between 11,250 and 11,750. Sure. But I think the animal spirits will come out. Okay. The, there will there'll be a lot of confidence loca locally. And I think there is a humongous amount of money waiting to be invested in India, both in direct investment and in portfolio investment. And this 23rd election was something which was inhibiting it. And I'm told that internationally, someone told me, I don't write it wrong, that funds, you know, who are managing about... MSI, who are benchmarked to the MSI, and who are managing 1.5 to 2 billion, trillion dollars, are uh, are sh uh, are uh, underweight. In I'm also told that a lot of those funds dial into you and get a sense on uh, no, no, uh, investing. No. <laughs> you know, to understand the investment no, climate. Anybody call, if anybody calls me, I talk to them. I am not an advisor or consultant to anybody. Okay, great. We've discussed the likely scenarios. I just want to also touch upon the unlikely scenarios, the elephants in the room. Uh, one is, of course, can 2019, is there any chance of 2019 uh, being a repeat of 2004? And what would that mean? I mean, a surprise that the markets have not priced in, are not prepared for. A third front, for that matter. That's the other unlikely scenario that we are not... I don't think so. The yeah, examples are not talking my, about it. My, I, I was predicting the same before the elections. 245, 50 seats for the BJP. I don't think that the opposition has given an alternative by which they can... First of all, they have, the BJP has done very good work at the grassroots. Second is the opposition has no program except Modi at all. And I don't think they, can, they are able to strike a chord with the Indian youth and the Indian aspirations. Right? So I don't think that the, uh, the, unle the, like, the scenario where the NDA does not get a majority, I think is very low. Okay. Let's not rule out anything in markets. But I think it's extremely unlikely. That, you know, it brings us to the same question that, you know, can exit polls be trusted and are they reliable? No, no, but I'm relying on my own, uh, my own instinct and judgment and the uh, exit polls. And this perception that if a third front or a fragmented coalition comes to power, that that would be perceived as not business friendly? Well, if a wicked wife comes, we'll think about it, how to deal with it. No, and I don't agree with that they're not business friendly. I mean, they say if a third front comes, Raghunam Rajan may be the finance minister. That will be like very much with the markets. And, I, you know, some of the... I don't think any government in India is, is less business-friendly and more business-friendly. They're all the same. Do you think markets are beyond governments? India is beyond governments. And mar India, markets are dependent on India. See, in, as I keep explaining again and again, India had a twist with socialism. Then, 91, we liberalized. But we have raised our rate of growth in every decade since independence. And I think... The decade of 20 to 30, we are going to see the fastest growth that India has ever seen. Because, you know, you have... See, India's potential... You know, India's potential goes up every year. And then, you know, we have seen the worst of GST. We have seen the worst of the problem of IBC. Of all these reforms, we have paid the price, but we have not seen the fruits. And the biggest thing which makes me very, very bullish, that, see, the journey... To limit chronic capitalism, it's a journey, it's not a destination. But slowly but surely in India, chronic capitalism is dying. And governance is what brings about real growth. The public activism, the growth, the death of chronic capitalism, the tax reform, the increase in tax to GDP ratio, the stoppage. And only thing which worries me is this competitive populism. We, are want, we want to give people to fish instead of teaching them how to fish. I think there's only so I think India is sitting on what is going to be the highest level of growth it has seen ever in the in from 2020 to 2020. So there will be no scenario in this election outcome come May 23rd that can lead to a panic sell off in the markets. I don't say that I, I don't say in my opinion there wouldn't be that there will not be we will know only in posterity but in my opinion it will not be and I can always be wrong. Right, uh, Mr. Jindamala, you know. When Prime Minister Modi came to power in 2014, expectations were sky high. 
now the jury is out whether he delivered or not it's an endless debate we won't go into that but what do you expect from his second term if indeed he comes back to power i think the the expectations in the second term are moderated and the results are going to be far better than the first term because see it is very difficult to change anything in india right india is an elephant in 5 years first of all is understood he's got a team right i think now he will be politically more brave having won an election two times so i think the second term will be far better than the first first because more expectations are moderated and i think performance will be better okay and in terms of what you expect specifically from his economic policy from his foreign policy are there any things that stand out in your mind see the farm policy i think we got to change lot of more things in farming than we are right he will try and do that you have a soil card better irrigation smaller irrigation potential support prices right i think all that will be much better in the second term and in economic see we are fighting to there are not many markets left in the world like india so our investment is going to come right question is we have to improve the ease of doing business right and i think we will make substantial progress there what about india's shortcomings if i were to ask you today that you know two three areas where you think india needs to focus and improve on what comes to i mind? think the biggest thing that uh, that limits india's growth is democracy but it's needed right so we cannot we cannot overrule it and second thing is see the bureaucratic system that we have created without blaming any individual but that can only be undone with technology and time what is the ease of doing business it's unlocking the bureaucracy so i think that is where india's shortcomings are and i think in the political class people want to create this casteism board bank but i think the millennials their leanings towards casteism is far lower and their aspirations levels are far higher so i think see in india india is you know it's all bottoms up nothing is and it's biologically evolving so i am confident in this i mean we are always going to grow below potential right because potential is 10 12% but that the, even if you grow at 8 9 is that less but 8 9 is also turning out to be challenging and i want to touch upon that point mm-hmm. sir you know when emer- when investors look at emerging markets there are two factors that drive their investments one is political stability second is growth visibility and india has been largely consistent on both those parameters over the last 20 years but at 7% while india is the fastest growing major economy in the world with the pressure that's coming in on global growth there is concern that that number will scale down to 6% maybe 6 and a half percent in no, this current financial year i don't think india's year. growth is necessarily linked to global growth because india's exports are far lower as compared to gdp and you know japan grew if what was the 80 to 90 and america was in recession and the world was in recession so world i, I don't think except if there is a financial shock in the world something like the euro breaking up or a debt crisis in china which also will be temporary so i don't see that india's growth will necessarily come and it is seven who says it won't go to eight who says it won't go to nine we have had so far yes we have so far capital expenditure for the last five years we had a banking crisis we had to pay the price of demonetization you know and the gst introduction we have paid all that now right. and now you look at the way credit risk credit culture in india is improving because of ibc right look at the way integrity is coming to the fore those people with integrity are the people who are creating the most wealth right but you you look at the very immediate lead indicators underlying lead indicators whether it's auto sales or industrial production numbers the lag in manufacturing activity do you think that even if it's for the very near term to the medium term that we could scale back a bit before going higher once again so markets are always discounting the future no if they are convinced that the growth will come back nothing will happen and i am convinced with the market so even if the growth was for the very near term to scale back to 6 and a half percent i already told may is better than april and don't remember forget one thing that the last two months have been very low on government expenditure which has created a lot of liquidity problems and i see no reason why interest rates should not be brought down in it 
So that was my next question. You see more support from the RBI? You've got Stop, 75 you bags. Know, you have, why should we not bring down interest rates? Right, and we got to create liquidity. And I think they will. They will. So 75 bips already in the bag. How much more do you think the RBI should move lower on rates? Well, I'm not an economist, but they should move lower. Let them decide. Okay. What about... See, Tanvir, I, am, I have only one place to invest in India. I don't invest anything outside India. I tell everybody when the food at home is so good, why look outside? And maybe it may take three, six months. I have confidence that India's growth will bounce back and bounce back at a rate which will surprise people. I just want to understand because, you know, sitting here right now, uh, I think people are just waiting and watching out for the political risk to get out of the way. Once it does, you think the trajectory would be to 8 to 9 percent that you're sure. calling as long term? Sure. Would I, it come by post FI20? FI21 onward? 2021, 20, I can't say I'm not. See, I can predict a direction. I can't predict the. See, we have had five years of a banking crisis, we have had subpar capital expenditure. We have, had a, we have had the introduction of GST, right? We have had demonetization. We have now having improvement in credit culture. We are having integrity come to the fore. The government making efforts of ease of doing business. The China, Japan, the China, America uh, spat on trade is a great opportunity for India. So I don't see any reason why growth in India will not come back with a bank. Okay, I want to address this for our international audience, and which is why I'm posing this question to you. Uh, on the subject of India's growth, we've had Dr. Raghuram Rajan in an interview in March this year say that we need an impartial body to look at the data. We've had the IMF chief economist, Geeta Gopinath, say last month that there are still some issues in the way India calculates its GDP. No, when, How when, would you... when did they arise? When did the arise? The question is because the American inflation changed. did uh, just because you don't agree with your figures, you're suspicious of them. You can't say the method of calculation is incorrect. If they were incorrect, Mr. Raghuram Rajan should have corrected them when he was the RBI governor. What was he doing? So, I mean, see, I don't rule. I'm. Uh, this is statistics is a lie. You know, if your feet is in the refrigerator and your face is in the oven, you may be right. You may be fine. But I, there is to needlessly suspect, you know, s s suspect government. And you know, man on the road is not bothered about six and seven. He's bothered on, on what's there on the road. Okay, that's a, that's so you believe the numbers, you believe the calculation is right and accurate, yeah, and the growth trend would look in up. In America, when inflation didn't go up, people said, no, no, they are cheating, they are cheating. So they, if the statistics suits you, fine. If it doesn't suit you, it's cheating. Okay. So on record, I have Rakesh Junjanwala saying 8 to 9% is the long-term growth trend for India. No, no, I think long-term is double digit. Ah, okay. I'm saying 8 to 9% in the near future. You have to give me some timeline as to when we get into double digits maybe because 20, that's India's potential. Maybe 22, 23, 23, 24. It's a process. So India is at an inflection point. I think so. Okay. Another risk uh, and another uh, issue that I get asked very often is actually the number one concern uh, when investors are watching uh, at uh, the growth trends in India, and that's the joblessness here. Uh, you know, talking because of that leaked report that came out in well, January. The joblessness has come today, or it was always there. Well, the the headlines have hit the screen now because the jobless rate came because in at a forty-five year because, high. Because the politicians want to raise some topic. No? Was it lower under the Congress rule? How do you say that? The, who has, has anyone measured it correctly? So I don't say that they may not be there, but it, it is necessarily there, I don't agree. And let me tell you one thing, foreign investors in the direct investment, in the uh, FDI are very important to me in India. I don't think they're important to me in the stock market. And if they're important, it's only the long-term investors. Don't forget what Mark Faber said, the locals know best. And so you think that momentum will be carried on, this growth of 8 9%, 10% plus will come in with lots of job opportunities yes, will, and improvement in the quality I, of life for I, I told you the reason why I feel so. Per it's, capita is also expected to go up. go up. And we have reached that level now where consumption expenditure, $2,100, consumption expenditure will go out through the roof. Discretionary consumption expenditure. Hmm. That $2,100 can go up significantly, you think, in conjunction with the growth It should rates? go up. Because population growth is also limited. If we grow 8%, population growth is 2%, it should go up 600% a year. Okay. In actual terms. Maybe 12% in, in uh, nominal terms. 
Okay. One big global concern that I want to address with you is what's happening with the U.S.-China trade war and what it means for India. You know, right now the big uh, talking point is how the fallout of that war would lead to shifting of global supply chains to Southeast Asia. I want to understand from you, do you think that India could be part of that shift, See, part of, all, of that conversation? First of all, certainly India could be part of that shift. First of all, you know, this is not a trade war, it's a geopolitical war. It's, uh, according to me, it's a friction between China and Russia and America, who will be the leader of the world, right? So it's not a trade war, it's a geopolitical war. Third thing is when two monkeys fight, we should always benefit. So in this geopolitical war, we are strategically important to both countries, right? Second thing is today, nobody, suppose you need to supply to India. Nobody would like to take the risk of manufacturing in China if India puts tariffs there. So I think that's totally beneficial to India, both strategically, politically, and economically. What can India do to seize the opportunity? Because I know under Prime Minister Modi is making it. By doing ease of doing business. Yeah. And uh, essentially under make, make in India, try and position itself yeah. as a low-cost manufacturing yeah. hub for the world, as an alternative to China? Absolutely. Okay. I want to talk about markets. And because we've addressed the top-down approach and the top-down view of, uh, for India, Let's go bottom up because that's where the opportunities lie. Underlying earnings, which have been a lag for the last five years, do you think they'll finally catch up? Do you think there'll be a major momentum that'll push yeah. earnings higher? Yeah, I think one thing is because a lot of the banking sector, which was you know dragging down earnings, state bank, all the public sector banks, some of the private sector banks, ICICI, I think they will do very well in terms of earnings. So I think that will lead to earnings growth. Also, I think as the economy improves, the general com companies will do better. And I don't look at uh, you know, earnings growth in cumulative. But one thing I can tell you, we are at the bottomest point of corporate profits to GDP. Right? We, I mean, we're at 3, 3.5%. Three we had to, gone to as high as 8%. Or we had, maybe at 4%. There's nowhere to go but up. Unless and until there's some disruption in, in the world. So peak earnings were about 18 to 19 percent, you know, when we saw in the previous cycle. Yeah, but they were 8 percent of GDP. We were at 4 percent of GDP. But you think we can go back to those levels? And this is the point when we do? We will, but it's a process. It's not going to go back in a year. Maybe it'll take three, four years. What would that mean for market valuation, sir? Because, you know, price to earnings are at 18, 19 times. And I know I'm breaking it down to the very basic, but do you think that... You know, investors will Indian have to wait for... India is an expensive market, it will get more expensive. <laughs> okay. So even 21, 22 times, investors will still so flood India. They will still find it compelling. Are, in the Nifty, there are companies with 5 P and there are companies with 60 P. Does the polarization worry you? Well, all polarizations have been followed by huge rises. When markets improve, the money goes below, 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 below. And the narrow, and the narrow, and the difference in the valuations is narrow. That's history; it's not an opinion. What about the health of uh, Indian businesses? Uh, and I'll cite examples. You know what's happened with the ADAG Group, Jet Airways, Z Group. How do you how look it, at how these does episodes? It to the, how much percentage are they of the entire market? Some and of these companies are. And one thing is, I'm, I'm names, happy. I'm, I'm unhappy if anybody. You know, any individual, anybody loses money or his company goes bankrupt. But I'm happy the inefficient should die. That's, that's the Darwinian theory. Yeah, but sometimes retail investors get trapped on the downside. Especially so who says this is a stock market, man, buy it, beware. Right? There is investors are investors, there are no small investor and big investor. Two sectors I want to focus on. One is uh, banks and NBFCs because they form 40% of the index and aviation. And let me start with aviation because we've seen something very interesting happen there. You know, the, the jet airway saga has played out. Now you've had Indigo having a promoter dispute. Uh, Air India is bleeding. The sector is really, really dwindling. So the, 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 the But your investment, let me complete that. Your investment, SpiceJet, which is a low-cost carrier, has actually done well for you. So what's your thinking about aviation as an investment uh, See, sector? See, aviation is a, is a big growth story. And there are really, literally only two uh, I mean, airlines which are not bankrupt. Or three airlines. The uh, Indigo, SpiceJet and the Tata Group. I'm, I'm told that Vistara has lost two to and a half thousand crores 
to where to reach where it is and it will lead further investment of 2 to 5000 crores so you're not going to have anybody come and invest 5000 crores in india to create new airlines so you're not going to have new airlines this market is going to grow there are going to be three group of solvent players and one insolvent player in air india right what is going to happen I'm i know your your investment will give you I'm, a lot I'm of returns <laughs> You're extremely bullish. I have an investment in SpiceJet. I must disclose. Wait, yeah. But I'm extremely bullish on the airline industry. Were you disappointed to see what happened with Jet Airways? Because even at a personal level, you know, all of us have flown Jet Airways. We've been, you know, uh, jet frequent flyers and things have just gone down pretty quickly. We have become frequent flyers with uh, with Vistar. What's wrong here? We're a global airline well, I mean, from India. See the, the the death of any company. I feel empathy with the promoter and the employees. But well, that's part of capitalism and evolution. Especially for aviation, because the social impact is significant. Why is so? I mean, people they all of them are getting employed. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, on banks, uh, the bad loan situation. Where are we on that cycle? I know you touched upon a little I while think earlier. I think is the last stage. I think everything is recognized. Thankfully, uh, thankfully, th you know, I'm warning from 2014. People have so been so bullish on banks. I said, not now, not now, not now. But I say now. Now it's over. It's over. Bad loans. We've yes, I mean, it's seen the last phase. For in ninety percent of the banks, some or maybe eighty percent of the banks, it's recognized everywhere. Recognized everywhere, but yeah. the resolution is taking time. Resolution is taking time, but then banks have income also. No? So I think the, as time comes, the Credit pre provisioning will profits will go up and the provisionings will come down. So you'll have a double effect on profits. And so, if you are saying now is the time to look at banks, are you saying particularly now is the time to look at state-run banks, corporate banks? I don't go so much, <laughs> you know, into everyone. What are banks? I'll tell you because within banks and the financial very bullish, services sector, I'm extreme. Of course, see the large public sector banks who have good balance sheets will do well. And I'm very bullish on the. Apart from the, I think the, I think apart from the Kotax and the SDFCs. The entire banking sector will outperform from now on. And so, the ones which have done well and are priced to a premium, uh, they'll continue to be compounding stories. But it's really the value pay where play where you know price to book is one time sub one time. That's where you think no, because value is their ROE is also reached 17, 18 percent, which they will in time. Then why will their books price to book not be three, three and a half, four times? Only thing market is waiting for the ROEs to reach there and be consistent. And I'm confident they will. All right. My last two questions, Mr. Jindamala. Two or three sectors that come to your mind if investors were to look at buying into India post the election? I think banking, pharma. Pharma will take time, but it will give a bumper return, according to me. I also think that infrastructure, to some extent, is, is very sweetly priced in. I think it's poised to do well because it's been beaten down. And then it's a buffet. Eat what you want. Don't overeat. But do you think India so far has been a, a strong a domestic consumption story? Uh, it may also provide equal opportunities in the investment-led space? Sure. It could. Okay. And so, drilling it down to specifics, I told you, I assured you that I wouldn't want to make this discussion about stock talk. But how can we not end with stock talk with Mr. Jinjinwala? So, two or three stocks that you think are the poster boys. No, 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 I, will, I will not speak on any stock. I will not recommend. That is not Okay, but do you think that? Uh, See, I'll tell you what happens. Today I recommend a stock. Tomorrow something happens, something changes. I sell my stock. I'm not going to go and tell your viewers I sold my stock. So it's not right to. Just allow me. Uh, you can choose not to answer my question, but just allow me. What I'm trying to understand from you is, you know, two or three stock stories, which you may not have had investments in, but you believe are poster boys of the Indian stock market in the sense that they are low beta, low volatility have been classic compounding stories, have given good ROEs, good dividend yields, are safe bets. I'm also searching once I find out. I'll <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Jindamala. Thank you very much for this exclusive chat. Have a lovely day. Thank you.